Nafina, an elite warrior guild. Nafina was made up of many battalions called Kachas, each with 3,000 warriors. In peaceful times, the main body of Nafina was made up of three Kachas, or about 9,000 fighting men, while in times of war this could expand to seven Kachas, or 21,000 trained, agile, and toughened noble warriors. But the Fina were more than just a gang of good fighters. Members were also required to be of the highest intellectual calibre, skilled in poetry, music, genealogies, and the histories of the lands and their peoples. The Fina was at once a warrior's training academy and a hero's guild. At the core of this great crowd sat Fionn as the central sun, with his selected comrades orbiting closest to him. The Fina stood as protectors of the established Gaelic order. They supported the High King and upheld the values and ethics of their warrior code, protecting the people and defending the land as and when occasion or principle demanded it. Surely this was a mighty force, one that kings sought to keep in their own favour, paying tributes and respect to the Fina through transfers of great wealth and land to the order. The tough trials and tests one had to undergo made sure only the best men of Ireland made their ranks. The path to becoming a member of the Fina was one of transformative initiation, and the decision to join was not one to be taken lightly. For once you became a member of the Fina, you were a member for life. A ceremony of both legal and symbolic significance occurs once a man has passed the trials of initiation and is ready to take his final steps in joining the guild. It meant stepping away from his family as his primary legal and social support unit and turning instead to his new clan, the Fina. He had to undergo a process of divorcing himself from his family and tribe, leaving behind the life of the settled man of the Tua and taking up the mantle of the warrior. He becomes an Eakland, or a kinless man. This is something that his clan would need to seriously consider and ultimately accept, since in legal terms, it meant that they would forgo their right to compensation in the event of the would-be fiend's injury and it would also have an effect on his inheritance and that of his own heirs. Upon joining the Fena, his comrades become his moral heirs and executors who would seek and get the satisfaction due if he were wounded or killed by any means that violate the code of honour or justice. The first requirement for joining the Fena was one that tested a man's intellect. Before physical prowess and strength was tested, Fianna hopefuls had to know the twelve books of poetry, which recorded the histories, genealogies and legends of Ireland. Once this basic elementary requirement was fulfilled, a candidate could move on to the physical challenges. First, while stood in a knee-deep trench dug into the ground and armed only with a shield and a staff of hazelwood, the candidate must avoid being hit by the spears of nine warriors being cast at him simultaneously from a distance of nine ridges away. Next, his sprinting is tested. Given the head start of one tree, he must evade a team of pursuers through a thick forest and escape unharmed. During the chase, he must be so agile that not a single braid of his hair comes loose by hanging branches, and so light-footed that he breaks no withered branches underfoot. Then his jumping and ducking is tested. He must bound over the branches of trees that are the same height as his head from the ground and stoop under branches as low as his knee without leaving a trembling branch behind him. Following this, while running at full speed, he must remove a thorn from his foot without slowing his pace. And finally, he must single-handedly face a great number of men and have no trembling of his weapon. Once he has successfully passed all the tests and received the assent of his family, he accepts the four Gesha of Fenian chivalry. 1. He shall marry his wife without portion, choosing her for her manners and her virtues. 2. He shall be gentle with all women. 3. He shall never reserve to himself anything which another person stands in need of. And 4. He shall stand and fight against all odds as far as nine to one. One account in the Dialogue of the Sages, told by Culture, gives an illustrative insight into the nature of the Fina and the sort of life which they valued. The remaining members of the Fina gathered on a hill to meet a king, accompanied by their new companion St. Patrick. 
Having answered the king's questions as to how many kings had granted lands to the Fianna, culture goes on to tell the tale of an Irish king, Feradoc Fiachnach. Upon his death, his two sons, Tuol and Fiacha, in competition for their inheritance, set about dividing the precious things of Ireland between them. Her various wealth and her treasures, her kine and her cattle herds, her dunes and her hill strengths, went to Tuol. While her cliffs and her estuaries, her mast and her sea fruit, her salmon, her hunting and her venery went to Fiachna. Culture continues by explaining that the latter portion, which most would condemn, is the portion that in the eyes of the Fianna was the best. For the Fianna were men of the forests, of the hills, of hunting and of adventure. They gave chase during the day, bathed in the rivers and lakes which still bear their names, recited poetry and played the harp by the fireside, and slept under a bed of stars each night. From Seamus McManus's story of the Irish race, quote, Roaming and roving from end to end of the island, hunting and fighting, feasting and lovemaking, the fiend made legend every day of their lives. New romance dawned for them with the dawning of each new day. Adventure and poetry marched with them on either hand, they lived exciting history. They breakfasted with song, supped with entrancing story, and, on their tree beds of branches, rushes and moss, bedded with rare dreams of yesterday's pleasuring and the morrow's daring. Their own warrior poets chanted for them their own heroic deeds, their own musicians corolled them, and their own scaladors, or storytellers, charmed their leisure hour with blithesome tale. They left lasting impression on every hill and vale and stream, from north to south, from east to west of the island. They hung rare tales of themselves on every rowan tree, and ten thousand great grey rocks that stood the island's face are monuments immortal, proclaiming to the wandering generations, Here passed Fionn and his fiend.